Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. Um, our guest today is from Bard College, where he serves as the director for the Center of Environmental Policy and the MBA in Sustainability that they have there, which he's going to talk a little bit about that program today, which is exciting. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from Williams College and his PhD in economics um, from the University of Michigan. Um, in recent years, he's coordinated climate education events at over uh, 2,500 universities, high schools, and other institutions across the country. Um, and today, he is here to present um, how to get a job saving the planet. Um, so he'll be focusing on sustainability leadership careers. Um, so everybody, please welcome Eben Goodstein. Thank you, panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, how many of you guys are seniors? Juniors? Sophomores? Any first years? A couple. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk today about how to get a job saving the planet. Uh, and first of all, I want you to let you know that the planet's going to be fine. You don't have to worry about it, okay? No matter what we do to it over the next hundred years, uh, give it a couple million and it'll recover just fine, right? Uh, and the world will once again be populated with all kinds of wonderful, beautiful, biodiverse creatures that we couldn't even imagine today, thanks to the magic of evolution by natural selection. So the planet is going to be fine. You don't need to worry about it. But from the point of view of our kids and grandkids, we've got some planet saving to do, right? Sort of create a world that is beautiful and livable um, and sustainable for them. So uh, with that introduction, let me um, tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm Director of Graduate Programs and Sustainability at Bard College. Bard is a liberal arts college very much like uh, Colgate, about 90 miles up the Hudson River from New York City, um, so about two hours from here. Um, and we offer graduate programs in uh, environmental and climate science and policy. So policy is one area that we offer master's of science degrees in. Uh, we are starting a new Master's of Education in Environmental Education, um, and that's the second track that we have. And then the third track is an MBA in Sustainability, a business degree. Uh, and I'm going to talk about these programs sort of as illustrative of career options for you. Uh, and I also, before we leave, uh, maybe we'll get to it in the Q&A, I will tell you specifically how to get a job this summer, or when you graduate as a senior. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very specific uh, strategy for getting the green job that you want. Okay, so don't let me leave without doing that. All right? <laughs> so these, um, these are really the three big broad areas that you can think about if you want to pursue this kind of saving the planet work. Um, you can be in policy, education, or business. Okay? So let's talk about policy for a minute. I mean, that's a little bit nebulous. What does that mean, a career in policy? Well, the students who are graduating from our MS program, they want to pursue careers changing the rules, right? Because that's what policy is. Policies are rules. Um, and that means uh, they're going to have to engage typically with government, you know, at the UN, international level, national level, state and local. Uh, understand you're, you're doing that tonight. Um, so, you know, that's where the rules get set. Um, uh, but increasingly, they're also set in the business world. So every big college university, every major hospital, or in fact every big corporation now has got a chief sustainability officer. And really, folks who are doing sustainability within organizations are really in the policy business, right? They're trying to change the rules of those organizations to green their operations. In the case of university, to go climate neutral by 2019, uh, to sort of get you know, more organic and local food on the table, reduce your water use. So that, those are really policy jobs, okay? So, you know, most of us grew up thinking we might be, you know, firefighters or, or nurses, but we don't really think policy work, but it's kind of what it is. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, education, you guys are familiar with, right? You can pursue a career in education. Um, but, uh, but by that, I, I don't mean just, you know, grade school teachers and professors and researchers. I also mean artists and journalists and rabbis and imams and... Uh, Preachers, you know, anybody whose job it is to be in the business of communicating about the scientific and ethical dimensions of the sustainability challenges that we face. Um, and we are starting a new MED in environmental education that's really going to focus on folks who want to be on farm educators, science educators, museum workers, and also teach in, in private schools. 
It's not a certification program for the public schools. Um, and then the final bucket is business. And this one is a little bit like, okay, I mean, isn't, we don't really tend to think of business as being in the solutions bucket, right? It's in the problems bucket because business pollutes and exploits workers. But increasingly over the last 15 years, we've seen the emergence of the business sustainability movement, which is really about how do I build a mission-driven business that's actually in business to solve social and environmental problems, right? How do I use business tools to build organizations that can actually get stuff done? Okay, so those are the three broad areas where you can pursue a career saving the planet. How many of you, uh, sort of just think for a minute, how many of you see yourself as maybe the policy bucket? How about the business bucket? How about the education bucket? How about the I'm not sure yet bucket? Or the more than one bucket? That's exhausting, okay, so that's pretty much, so think about that, you know, just let that sit with you as I'm talking today, okay? So, um, what do I want to talk about? Uh, we've had a couple of Colgate grads go through our policy program. Um, so, most recently, Molly Gilligan graduated two years ago, I think. Um, she did her internship. I'm going to talk about internships as being an important part of a master's program. She interned at the, Inter, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. She did a six month internship with them as part of our master's program. Um, and they liked her so much that they kept her on. And she's been working them, for them for two years out in Montana, of all places. She interned in D.C., but she's working remotely from Montana uh, on their women and gender and development and climate project. Um, and Lauren Frisch graduated a few years ago. Uh, again, she did her internship uh, on uh, ocean acidification, interestingly enough, out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is extremely far from the ocean. Uh, but nevertheless, they had a, a research center there focused on ocean acidification. She went there, um, and they kind of liked her so much that she stayed on. Um, and so this idea of a professional internship in the context of a master's degree is a pretty good idea. And I'm going to talk more about sort of the importance of experiential education beyond the undergraduate degree. Okay? Um, so, yeah, that's a couple of Colgate, Colgate folks who've, who've gone through our program. I want to issue an, you an invitation uh, the weekend of December 2nd through 4th, if you're interested in this, come over to BARD. We're doing a weekend leadership workshop called the C2C Fellows Training Program. And we'll really focus for beginning Friday afternoon and running through Sunday at noon on sort of in detail, kind of what are the skills you need to develop if you really want to pursue a leadership career in this space and really want to make a difference in your 20s. And you kind of have to because, well, because we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to circulate uh, a couple sign-up sheets, and if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, either for the graduate programs uh, or for uh, the C2C Fellows Network, just put your name down there, and we will, uh, you know, we won't overwhelm you with emails, but you'll get occasional updates from us. Indicate, you know, business, policy, education, which one you're interested in, or C2C, if you want to put your name down for that. Okay, so saving the planet. Why are we here? Why are we all here? Well, I think we. We get that. Um, and our work at BARD is really motivated by this understanding that we're living in a truly extraordinary moment in the history of the human species. In the sense that the work that you guys are going to do if you pursue the saving the planet work is going to have a profound impact. And not only on your own lives and the lives of your children, but in fact for every human being who's ever going to walk the face of the planet from now until the end of time. Because we happen to be living at this moment where 10,000 years of human history have crashed in the next three decades, and you guys have got to figure out how we're going to meet the needs of now seven and a half, soon to be nine, soon to be 11 billion people in a world where we're already fighting over water and oil and topsoil and fish and forests and biodiversity, <laughs> and in a planet that's getting hotter all the time. All right? Uh, you know, I'm 56. You guys are 20-ish, right? And... So I, my students are, are 30 years younger than me, typically, and I think in terms of that 30-year gap. So 30 years from now, it's going to be 2046. I'm going to be an old man. I'll be 86. You guys will be my age, more or less, a little younger. And at that point, we're really going to know the future of the Earth in a very profound way. Right? We're going to know, you know, did we meet the needs of another couple billion people? Uh, and, you know, the three and a half that are, you know, barely living on $2 a day right now and are all aspiring to a better quality of life. Did we solve that problem? But more fundamentally, how high is it going to get? And is global warming going to drive the planet, you know, 
4 degrees Fahrenheit hotter or 8 degrees Fahrenheit hotter within your lifetimes. And I always put that number in perspective. You know, during the last ice age, when this particular building was covered by a couple thousand feet of ice, the world was only 9 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is right now. So we've got to figure out, you guys have got to figure out, and we do too, how are we going to force all the swinging global temperatures of ice age magnitude only in the opposite direction? And to do that, we've got to rewire the entire world clean energy, redesign cities across the earth, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and in doing all, the, all that, really figure out how to put sustainability instead of profitability and growth, you know, at the center of what we're doing on the planet. So you guys in the right room? I mean, did you come to the right room for this? Okay, all right. That's what we're going to do, all right? So let's, let's just take a look at, and think about the climate change situation. I mean, you know, this is Hurricane Irene. Uh, this was the first of the tropical hurricanes to hit this part of the world in the last few years. And Sandy... Uh, this is the western United States pretty much every year now. Um, the, the western forests in the western U.S. are transforming as the fire season gets longer with spring coming earlier, fall going later, it gets drying out. Those forests are transforming uh, and they're, they're not going to come back in the sort of the dense conifer environments that we always thought were permanent. California in the worst drought in 1,200 years. This was a, a, a headline from the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago talking about the flooding in Louisiana. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then here's another headline um, just from last week about uh, the town of Barrow uh, on the north slope of Alaska. It's the most northern, northernmost town in the United States. Uh, there's about 4,000 people that live there, uh, mostly Inuit people. It's the staging ground for the north slope oil development, and it will be gone in 30 years. The sea ice is melting, the sea levels are rising. That land is just disappearing at an incredibly rapid rate. Those people have to move somewhere. These are Inuit people who have lived in this space for 12,000 years, and it's not going to be habitable for them. Um, so it's on us now, and again, uh, we have to figure out how we're going to get there. And this is the Bloomberg headline uh, after Sandy. <laughs> and this is, again, the picture that this is, you know, what does it mean to, you know, what is the Save the Planet business? Well, a lot of it is really about bending this curve, right? Here's the temperature baseline, pre-industrial. That's a rise of almost 2 degrees Fahrenheit, 1.8. It actually is 2 degrees Fahrenheit that we've already come pre-industrial. And we have to figure out how to bend that curve and stop it at 4 degrees, right? we got to stop it at 4 degrees. That's what we got to do, okay? That's what, in many ways, what the Save the Planet business is about. And it's not just this. Obviously, it's toxic pollution, deforestation, biodiversity loss. Um, and I can just see all of you kind of like melting, like, oh, God, we have to do this? <laughs> That's what we have to do? Yeah, we do. And, and part of, of working in this space is really kind of looking at these pictures and not being depressed by them or, or paralyzed, but actually being motivated. Saying, yeah, it's what I want to do. I want to spend my life, my time on Earth, bending that curve. That's what I want to do. Um, and the good news is, we can do it. It's not a technical or economic problem, right? So if we think about the global warming case, you know, here we are in 2016, we're emitting 34 or 5 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if we just kept doing what we were doing, you know, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, we'd be double that, and that's a recipe for planetary suicide of the kind we've talked about. But we can change directions and cut emissions by 50% or more by 2050. And then by the end of the century, completely eliminate carbon emissions from the global economy. We can do that. Okay? And you may think, how? That seems impossible. Right? But what was the major pollution source from transportation here in Hamilton, New York, 100 years ago, just the turn of the century, last century, before World War I? Major poop. Yeah. Horse poop, right? Horse poop was the major pollution from transportation hundred years ago. And we've definitely managed to reduce emissions of horse poop by well over 90%, right? Over the last hundred years, we did that. So, I went from horses to cars, we've got to go from cars to something else. <clears throat> and, you know, that something else is not a mystery. Right? There's a guy named Elon Musk who's got a company called Tesla who is building that future right now. And if you run your vehicles on batteries and you charge those batteries with renewable energy, wind, solar, beautiful wind turbines coming down from Syracuse on 
Maybe two your day. Uh, you're done. You solve the problem. Right? Um, and Germany's gone from 6% renewal in 2000 to uh, over 30% in 2015. 15 years they went from 6% to over 30%. And it's really just a matter of you know politics and political will and, and driving those technologies because they're cost effective. So we're in a point where, you know, my, my colleague Hunter Lovins, who teaches our MBA, says we're in a race to stop global warming. And that's the good news. We're in a race. We haven't lost, right? But we have to behave like we're in a race and we have to commit ourselves to, to changing that future. So, you know, you guys saw the debate last night. Many of you did or heard about it. We're living in a truly ex weird time in, in American life. And I'm going to talk more about politics tonight. I'm giving a talk on politics and the environment specifically tonight. But um, absent Donald Trump, I mean, we're, we're, we're living at a, a moment where the gridlock in Washington, D.C. is as bad as it's ever been. I mean, you almost have to go back to before the Civil War to find a time when Washington has been as paralyzed as it is now. And I'm going to talk about that tonight. How did we get to that point? Okay. Our economy is a little bit teetering, you know. Um, Trump made a lot of good points last night about how, uh, you know, many people are getting left behind from uh, what has been, you know, a recovery from the worst recession ever. And lots of folks are nervous that that recovery is not going to last and that the global economy is not sound, right? And you know, as far as you guys are concerned, it just sort of seems hopeless, right? Because all of your adult life, that's what you've experienced. But when you get depressed about that, um, and you will if you do this kind of work, because you've got to keep your eyes open in a way that most people don't, um, I always fall back on Margaret Mead's uh, famous quote that you never want to underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world because, does anybody know how that ends? You never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world because, indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. And by definition, that's true, right? Anything you think about, whether it's a political idea, a technology, whatever, always started because a few people had an idea. They sat down over coffee, talked about it, right? And then it went viral in some way, right? Even before the internet, things went viral. Uh, and you guys are familiar with virality. I mean, you understand kind of the power that technology has given us to make change really fast. And one of my favorite examples of that is uh, uh, actually our MBA program is down in the financial district in, in New York City. Uh, we'll talk more about it in a minute. But we actually looked down over Zuccotti Park where Occupy Wall Street occurred, right? And if I had asked you guys five years ago, kind of what is the 99% and the 1%, you would have said, I don't know, what is that? It's like a sale at Walmart or something? What, what is the 99? I don't know. But now, I'm sure most of you guys in this room understand that it's a dialogue about the profound wealth inequality that's been emerging over the last 20, 30 years to the point that 80 people, 80 people own more than the bottom half of the people alive on the world. 80 people own more than 3.5 billion poor people. Okay. And we now have a shorthand for that because a bunch of young people sat down in Zuccotti Park, occupied Wall Street, and had a brilliant marketing message um, that, you know, has spread around the globe. So now actually billions of people understand that this is a shorthand for that conversation. Okay? And that for me is inspiring. It's an example of what a few people can do. Um, that's me getting arrested. Um, that was not at Occupy Wall Street. It was actually about a month before, and it's another example of the power of a small group of people to sort of spread an idea. So if I'd asked you guys five years ago what the Keystone Pipeline was, nobody would have, no, I didn't know what it was. Nobody knew what it was five years ago, uh, or a little bit over five years ago. And now I bet a bunch of you know. Maybe not everybody, but a bunch of you probably do. So you shook your head. What, what is it? Yeah, it comes from Alberta, the tar sand oil fields up in northern Canada. It, well, it, it, it was going to be. It isn't, actually. Or it was a proposed pipeline running from Alberta down to Houston through the middle of the U.S. to, and this is really dirty oil, right? To, 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 you have to boil the sand, right, to get the oil out. And then you put it in the pipeline, it would come down to Houston. 
And this was going to happen. It was a done deal. Obama administration was going to approve. Um, and, uh, and then a few people, Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, others, kind of sent around an email. And they said, you know, if we really believe that we want to bend this climate change curve, we have to start keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And if we build this pipeline, that oil is going to get burned. So we need to put pressure on Obama because he actually had the ability to make the decision. It was right before the 2012 election. So they said, let's, let's do it. So they had a big call for a massive civil disobedience action in Washington, D.C. And about 1,200 people went down and got arrested over the course of two weeks. Um, and I was one of them. And then a month later, there was a, another rally in D.C. And 10,000 people went down there and gave the White House a big hug. And the next day, <clears throat> Obama said, okay, no pipeline. Now, this has never happened to me before, right? I went to Washington, asked for something, the next day I got it? I mean, it doesn't, never happened to me before, but it happened. And, and again, it was reflective of the power of a small group of people with a good idea to really change the direction of the debate. And as you may know, that pipeline never got built. Uh, it could very well get built, depending upon the outcome of the election. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton has opposed it. Trump is in favor of it, so the election matters in that context. But for five years, uh, anyway, it didn't get built. So funny story. Um, uh, so the, what happened was, uh, civil disobedience was we sat down in front of the sidewalk on the White House. We didn't block any gates. We just sat down on the sidewalk, and you can't do that. And the police told us, and we said, yeah, we know. That's why we're doing it. Um, so they came and arrested us. Uh, they arrested the women first, and then they arrested the men. So there's, you know, a couple dozen guys were sitting in the van, you know, and there's a couple young guys down at one end of the van, and they say, hey, you guys should come up to Wall Street in a couple weeks. It's going to be really big. And I'm at the other end, I'm like, yeah, right. I know what's going to happen. You know, you're going to have a little protest. You're going to get arrested. Big deal, you know, Not big deal, right? And then, you know, this happened. So I was totally wrong. And for me, kind of what sustainability work is about is a bunch of 20-somethings coming up with ideas that I think are crazy, but totally work, you know? And that's what you got to believe if you do sustainability work, right? That, you know, that along with millions and millions of other people around the world, you're, in, you're inventing ideas, you're, you're, you're innovating, you're creating new opportunities, and some of those things are going to go viral, and they're really going to change the way it works, okay? So... That's what you're getting yourself into to go down this road. Okay, this is politics, and again, I'm talking more about politics tonight. But I want to talk now for the next 15 minutes about, okay, how do you get paid to do this, right? How do you build a career in this space? Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about policy and business. I'll leave education to the side because you guys are probably a little more familiar with that. And I'm going to do it in the context of our graduate programs. Um, now... You don't have to get a graduate degree to work in this space. You can go work in business, policy, education, just you know, with your Colgate degree. That's, you, you can find a good entry-level work in that space. It's competitive, but you, know, you, can, you can do that. But if you want to pursue a leadership career in the space, then eventually you're going to get to need, you need to get a master's degree. Right? And that would be a policy degree, like we have MS policy degrees, or a law degree in the policy space, an MBA in the business space, some kind of education degree, you know, in the education space. Um, now, should you do that right out of grad, right out of undergrad, or should you wait? Um, and I'll defer that question to Q and A. We can talk about that. Um, so, uh, one of the key things to look for when you do go to graduate school is a program that really embeds meaningful experiential education into the master's program. It doesn't just kind of tack on an optional internship or something like that, but really builds the education around experiential learning. Because you can't learn sustainability in a purely academic way. You've got to be able to apply what you're learning to real-world experience in a concrete fashion. And also, it's the way you build your resume and create your networks to build your career. Okay? So, broadly speaking, in the policy world, there's three directions you can go. Again, these are jobs changing the rules, right? That's what you're all about. And one direction is government. 
right? So we got graduates who work for the you know, Department of Environmental Conservation, DEP down in New York, EPA, Department of Energy, um, uh, and work in state legislatures. So, and city governments, right? So all of that space is open for employment. The other space is business. Um, or, or large organizations, you know, organizational work. So we've got graduates who are, you know, sustainability officers and directors in colleges and universities at Kaiser Permanente, big healthcare organizations, uh, in uh, 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 consulting firms, helping organizations, you know, fix their problems. And then the third space is NGOs, right? And NGOs are typically going to be lobbying, educating, organizing to try and influence government policy um, or influence business policy. So, for example, you know, Greenpeace is always trying to get Citibank not to lend to uh, coal plants in developing countries, right? So those are kind of the three career directions, uh, government, business, and, and NGOs. I'll just give some recent examples of graduates from BART. So this is Emma. Uh, Emma graduated last year. Um, and... What we do at BARD in terms of experiential education is um, many master's programs are what I call cafeteria-style masters. You go somewhere for two years, you have a couple core classes, and then you take you know, five from a list of 20 and six from a list of 15 and kind of mix and match, and you get a collection of courses. Um, I think that's kind of lazy, so we, we've done it differently. And what we've done is we've actually compressed all the academics into the first year. Um, so it's interdisciplinary. You're, you're taking climate or environmental science, uh, environmental and natural resource economics, climate or environmental policy, law, statistics, econometrics. Everybody goes to Florida for, no, Florida, excuse me, Mexico uh, in January for uh, uh, immersion around a sort of World Bank style consulting project. But all the coursework is in that first year. That allows students to go off in the second year for a four to six month professional internship. So an extended high level professional internship when you're away on that internship, you're in communication with your thesis or capstone advisor, developing a thesis topic. You get back in January of the second year. Um, you have a 25-page paper due, and then you spend the second semester of that second year fleshing out your, your capstone or your thesis. So you have a whole year to really develop mastery, which is important, over your subject area in the master's program. So some examples. This is Emma. She interned with a consulting firm down in Washington, D.C. called ICF giant global consulting firm, um, and she worked on an energy efficiency project for them helping big box retailers like Walmart and uh, uh, Home Depot uh, figure out how to sell energy efficient appliances. Um, so working on the energy efficiency side. Um, they like her so much that they actually offered her a job, so she stayed on, she did her thesis remotely and, and is still working there. Kale, um, uh, Kale interned for the United Nations Environment Program in Thailand. Uh, and he worked at their office in Bangkok. And his job was to work with uh, uh, folks in developing country who were trying to access uh, global environment fund financing to help them sort of understand how, how would I make a proposal to get financing to support climate adaptation. Um, he continued consulting for UNEP, uh, but he recently got a job working for for an organization that supports city governments to become climate neutral, an organization called ICLE, uh, and is sort of you know, applying his skills there. <laughs> Rachel, uh, Rachel was actually a French major um, at Williams College and came to us and kind of got tooled up uh, through our first year coursework, and then went off to Haiti to work uh, uh, in an NGO that was helping the government, it was a Dutch NGO helping the government build a, a landfill outside of Port-au-Prince. If you ever traveled in the developing world, many of you know that just garbage is a horrible problem, you know, just managing solid waste. So this was the problem they were trying to solve. Um, and uh, they liked her so much that they also hired her on, um, and she wound up working with them for two years. So she went from being a French major who kind of knew she wanted to do this stuff but needed some, you know, some tools, got tooled up, and now she's finished that work. Um, she's really an expert. Uh, in solid waste management in a developing country context, uh, but she's got a job now working for a, a city government down in Florida uh, in their solid waste program. Um, and then this is Chris Lavely. Uh, Chris interned with um, New York State Energy Research Development Authority, ICERDA, uh, uh, in their multifamily energy efficiency program. 
Uh, they, they actually kept him on, but then he actually quit the job because he got a very prestigious fellowship with Environmental Defense Fund's Climate Corps last summer and, and spent time working with them. And now he's on the job market again in the, in the energy efficiency space. But he's got two incredible experiences on his resume, so I'm not worried about it. Okay? So that gives you a flavor of kind of the type of work you can pursue in the policy space. So you've got uh, Rachel working for government. She's working for city government, um, but previously had worked in an NGO capacity. You've got Kale working for an NGO that's really supporting government, city governments, to do better policy work. You've got Emma, who's in the private sector, you know, helping companies figure out how to sell energy efficiency products. And you've got Chris, who actually could wind up anywhere, given his focus, either policy, either, either uh, government or um, NGOs or business, given his experience in the energy efficiency space. Okay. I'm going to go on a blue streak here. Any questions on this? And then I'll switch to the business side. Any, any comments, thoughts? I can keep going. Okay, let's talk about business. Um, oh, okay, here's our degree, degree options. Um, so we have Master's of Science degrees in Environmental Policy or Climate Science and Policy. Anybody interested in the Peace Corps? Potentially. A couple of you, okay. Um, strongly recommend that you try and figure out how to do the Peace Corps jointly with a Master's program. Up until this year, the Peace Corps had a program that would allow you to do this called Master's International. But unfortunately, they axed it this year. So the sort of formal relationship between master's programs and the Peace Corps is gone. But at BARD, we continue to support students that want to do this. And it's really a great way to do the Peace Corps. So what happens is you come to us and you do your first year's coursework. Um, and then you go off and do your two years of Peace Corps service, and that counts as your internship. Then you come back and you write a thesis based on that experience. It's a much better way to do the Peace Corps because, for one, you go in with a year's worth of master's coursework, so you're going to be a stronger you know, uh, Peace Corps volunteer in the space you're going to be in. But second, you actually get to reflect on your Peace Corps experience in an academic context. And you're going to write a thesis about it. And that's going to give back much more to the country than many Peace Corps volunteers who just kind of come back one day and then like, oh, that was fun. You know, now on to the next thing. Okay? So it's a, and it's just a much stronger career development sort of track if you want to pursue work <coughs> in international development. Okay? Um, we have a joint JD with, with Pace Law School. We could talk about that, law school as a, dr a direction to go. Um, I mentioned our MED program, and then we have a joint uh, MS MBA option. Okay, let's talk about business. Um, again, you know, this, this idea of business is sort of being the solution, you know, is a little bit iffy. How does that work? But as I mentioned, really beginning about 15 years ago, you had the beginnings of an emergence of a sustainable business movement. And, and the basic idea here is, how do you build a business that's actually in business to solve a social or environmental problem? It's got to be profitable. It's a business, right? So you've got to pay your bills, and you've got to have uh, money, earn money in order to scale and grow, because if you don't grow, you're not going to be solving the problem. Okay? But it's a very different approach. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. So Ecovative is a company from Troy, New York, and their mission is to remove styrofoam from the face of the earth. That's their mission, okay? You know, I probably don't have to tell you why we need to do that. I mean, styrofoam is a nasty thing, um, but we need it, right? Because we ship stuff around, and we need things that create some structure that things don't break, right? Um, but, you know, when we're done with it, we throw it away, can't do that. There's no, there's no such thing as a way, right? Lasts for 10,000 years in the environment, okay? So what this company does, they say, well, you know, how would nature solve this problem? We have a packing problem. Because nature's been designing stuff sustainably for about 4 billion years, okay? And this is really one of the tenets of sustainable business. It's what we teach in our MBA. Um, that sort of the key to really building a sustainable economy is figuring out how to do ecological design. Learning from nature, biomimicry, that's really fundamental to thinking about how we're going to meet the needs of 9 or 10 billion people on the planet. Okay? So what this country, company does is they actually grow uh, big blocks of mushrooms, sort of super tightly intertwined fungus, um, in dark rooms with no added temperature, no energy going in, um, and then they kill it. 
and then they chop it up, and you've got shipping peanuts. And when you're done with that, you really can throw it away, right? Where would you throw it? Outside. Yeah, outside or in your garden for compost, right? Um, so, uh, uh, and they're growing it actually in molds to put around computers and wine bottles and all that stuff. So, and they figured out how to do it profitably, right? They took them a while, but they got there, they did R&D. They partnered with some big shipping firms, and you're really going to see them start to move the needle. They're going to start moving styrofoam out of the supply chain in many, many directions. Okay? Uh, another example, uh, you have big companies like Nike and Levi's and others um, who kind of got pushed into this in the 90s because they got into trouble around labor issues and sweatshop. And so they kind of got religion around sustainability and in the era of transparent supply chain said, you know, we really need to start to take responsibility for up and down our supply chain. And they recently looked at their, uh, their water use and the foot, their environmental footprint, especially in developing countries. And they said, you know, we're one of the major sources of water pollution in, in Thailand and, and Cambodia and Vietnam. And rather than kind of pat themselves on the back and say, yeah, but we're obeying the laws in Vietnam, we're good corporate citizens, they said, we're, we're going to fix this. And so they innovated and they created a waterless dyeing process. Um, and, and they're going to phase out water-based dyeing in their production process. And they're going to actually eliminate that water pollution problem. And they're going to do it profitably because they figured out a cost-effective alternative. They just redesigned what they're doing. A lot of this is about radical redesign instead of band-aids. Um, and that's what we teach uh, in our MBA program. So a few more examples uh, we can talk about later if you want. So let's go back to sort of examples. Okay, what, okay what, where are the jobs in this space? What does it mean to do sustainable work in a business context? And again, I'm going to reference our, our MBA program. So the MBA program, we got started about five years ago. We're in our fifth year. Uh, and it's a low residency program. It's actually uh, one weekend a month and then online. So it's, and it's down in Manhattan, as I mentioned. It's down in the financial district. So classes meet Friday morning to Monday afternoon once a month, and then online Tuesdays and Thursday nights. So that means you can work comfortably sort of 30 to 40 hours a week and do the program. Uh, uncomfortably more than that, you need to do the part-time version. Um, and it also means that we can tap into fantastic faculty, right? Because we're in New York City, and we've got practitioners who are inventing this stuff, and they're in the classroom. Um, uh, but, you know, as you think about graduate schools, I mean, this direction of hybrid programs, definitely keep that on your radar. Um, there's all sorts of online options, but I think the hybrid programs really have the potential to really change the nature of education because I think of our program as 24-day retreats spread out over two years and tied together by online. If you've been to conferences or retreats or you come to our C2C workshop, you can get a sense of how powerful that kind of learning environment is where you're totally immersed for four days, um, and you get to integrate it into your current work, um, and you don't have to give up two years of pay to go to graduate school. And the technology has gotten so good that why not? I mean, we can really do good lecture discussions online, but you need the weekends to create community and networks um, and do team projects and all that stuff. So you get the best of both worlds in the context of the hybrid system. So those are going to be increasingly dominant, I think, in the graduate school space. Um, in terms of experiential, um, again, really key. What we do in our MBA is that we actually put our first-year students directly into consulting roles. So, and nobody, no other MBAs I know do this, but we trust our students to do this. So from day one, you're on a team of five or six students working for a real-world business for nine months on a sustainability challenge that they offer. So last year, we worked for Siemens Wind and JetBlue and the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. And this year we're working with Eileen Fisher and Etsy, and we work with big banks like UBS and HSBC. Um, and, and of course you don't really know, you know it's kind of scary, right? Because you're actually consulting for a company you don't know anything yet because you haven't taken any classes. But it's one of those systems where you know you learn what you need to learn as you move along, and it's carefully mentored. And for example, it's taught by, example of our great faculty, is taught by Laura Gitman, who's the head of the biggest and oldest consulting sustainability firm, management firm, in New York, their, their New York City branch. Uh, and so, you know, we can bring great expertise in to help you support that. Okay? So anyway, 
Again, you want to be looking for that kind of experiential dimension for your graduate program. Because again, it gives you great resume, gives you serious experience that you can bring to your work, um, and it can open all kinds of doors for you. So in terms of the career directions on the business side, there's really four if you want to work in the saving the planet business. There's entrepreneurial work, there's sustainability management consulting for business, there's pursuing a traditional business role in a mission-driven company, you know, like, a, like in marketing or sales or whatever, in a company you believe in. And then finally, there's trying to help a traditional company move along this sustainability journey towards a more mission-driven focus. And that's going to be typically in a sustainability role in a traditional company. Make sense? So, examples. This is Libby Murphy. Um, she, uh, <clears throat> she is a board entrepreneur, and she has a company called Up Homes. And this company is envisioned to disrupt the mobile home industry. Right? Think about mobile homes, you know, double-wide aluminum structures that haven't changed much in 80 years. So she's building what she calls the IKEA of mobile homes. Uh, uh, they, they built a, they got raised $50,000 for a prototype, and now they're in their seed funding for a demonstration project. Um, it's a very cool company. Uh, David is a sales guy at Tesla. Right, just in sales. He's one of the best salesmen in the Northeast. But this is a company that he believes in. He's coming on board with a mission. Um, he's excited about sort of being with a company that's really driving towards uh, uh, a real change in the nature of, of transportation. Burnell um, came to us uh, already being executive director of an organization that helped people stay in their homes by giving them second mortgages uh, or, or helping them pay off their second mortgages. But she used her capstone project in the MBA to develop a new business line to support origination of loans. So now there's, you know, uh, hundreds of New Yorkers are getting access to moderate low income New Yorkers getting access to home loans because of her work. Uh, Christine is, went to work for a traditional company, Pratt & Whitney, as their sustainability director. Right? So this is a company that makes engines. Obviously has great potential in the sustainability space, felt like they were doing good stuff, needed somebody to really help them strategically figure out how to play in that world. Megan is doing sustainability management consulting at BSR. Um, and Miles is another entrepreneur. He's got the coolest company in the world. It's a rooftop aquaponics outfit in New York City, in Brooklyn. Right, so uh, he got written up in Forbes last year, actually because of the coolness of their company. Um, so what this is is big tanks of uh, tilapia on the rooftop, kind of very densely populated tanks. And then they use the fish waste to grow basil and greens, uh, which they then sell to high-end restaurants in New York. Okay. Now, it's a startup. It's a small company. Uh, um, but it's the kind of thinking that can save the planet. Because it is a closed loop production process, like in nature, you know, in nature, no such thing as waste. All waste is food, right? And that's what they've developed, because it's a system where there is no waste. All completely recycled. And if we're really going to meet the protein needs of 11 billion people, we've got to figure out how to do that, right? We've got to figure out how to create these closed loop systems instead of dumping trillions of tons of nitrates into the Mississippi River and Chesapeake Bay and pretty much every other major water system in the world, right? So if Miles can scale that up, then he's, you know, a long way towards fixing lots of problems we have to face. So at the end of the day, you know, what we're looking for is a mixture of what you do well, what the world will pay for, what the world needs, and what you love. And that's bliss, right in the middle of the Venn diagram there. So, um, I, get, I have a lucky job. I'm in the bliss business. So my job is to help young people figure out how to work in this space. So I'll just say that by virtue of attending today, you now have free lifetime career advising from me. Uh, so if you get stuck when you're thinking about your career over the next couple of years, anytime, feel free to give me a call, send me an email, and just say, hey, you know, you talked to us at Colgate back in October of 2016. You know, what do I do next? Um, and uh, I'll probably repeat the advice I'm going to give you in a few minutes about finding a job. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to sort of 
spend 10, 15 minutes with you guys talking about that. That's what I do. Um, and uh, if you're thinking about graduate school, uh, come down and visit us at Bard. Uh, and uh, these are the two of the programs, right? Change the rules, transform the game. We're moving into the education space as well. But, um, you know, I give talks about climate change and mass extinction all the time, and people say, isn't that depressing? I mean, doesn't that kind of leave you hopeless? Uh, and I think, you know, we all, we're all here because we recognize there's two futures out there, and one is pretty dystopic, right? It's the year 2080, 2090, you know, your kids are not that old, and, and we're looking at a world that's going to be 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is now, and none of us wants to go there. Post-water shortage, post, you know, peak oil, just not the world we want. But there is a second future, and I think we're all alive to that, and that's what we're about at Bar, right? Every one of our students wants to figure out how to be part of leading the change. So uh, come join us. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, questions? Yeah. So what is the advice about finding a job? Okay. Uh, you want to write to that one, huh? <laughs> Um, okay, let's do a little exercise. Um, first of all, uh, where do you want to, everybody answer this question for themselves. Where do you want to be either next summer or if you're a senior, you know, next summer and beyond, next fall? Geographically, what city do you want to live in? Next summer or in your first job at school? Everybody got an answer? San Francisco. Okay, San Francisco. Uh, everybody tell, just tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor where you want to be. Oh, no, no, you have to pick one. You can't throw up your hands. You have to pick a city, okay? Okay, everybody pick the city. Just for fun, okay? All right, you don't, you know, you're not committed, okay? All right, the next thing you have to do is you have to say, okay, um, you know, generally, what do I want to do? You know, is it policy, business, or education? Okay, everybody pick. You're not committed, you know, this is just for the summer, right? Okay, everybody got an answer? Okay. Next thing you got to do is you figure, okay, broadly, what area? Do I want to do energy, water, food, toxics, biodiversity? You can tell your neighbor. <laughs> Climate? You don't have a neighbor. Whatever. Okay. So tell me, what do you want to do? Um, energy policy. Okay. All right. So what you need to do is sometime in the next week, because you're thinking about next summer, I want you to go to the web, and I want you to type in Boulder, Colorado, Renewable Energy, uh, NGO. Okay? Just see what pops up. You're going to get a bunch of hits. Um, then do a little research. You guys are good at research. You're Colgate students, right? Um, and in particular, what I want you to do is I want you to find the three people in Boulder, Colorado, who are doing the most really interesting work in this space. Okay? Uh, folks that you just, you just really love to work with. Okay? Um, and, uh, and then, um, once you've done that, so you have to actually find, you've got, you found the organizations, right? But then you have to find a person within that organization who you think is doing cool work. All right? Um, so then, what you've got to do is you have to figure out how to get their email so you can contact them. Um, and here's how you do it, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to email or call the administrative person at that organization and say, I'm a student at Colgate College in New York, and I'm writing an article on leadership in renewable energy in Boulder, Colorado, uh, and uh, I'd love to interview Jane Smith, right? And can I have her email? And they'll say, sure. I mean, why? That seems reasonable, right? So they give you the email, so you write her, and you, and you tell her that, right? Um, and uh, uh, can, can I interview you for this article? And, you know, of course, she'll, I mean, who wouldn't say yes to that, right? Okay. So um, then you interview her, uh, and then what do you do? Well, you have to write the article, because you can't lie, right? You actually have to write it. Okay, so you do that. Um, and then uh, you have to publish it online somewhere. So where would you publish it? Good place. Colgate newspaper, right? 
great place, or, or if there's an environmental studies blog or something, or send it to us and we'll publish it on the bar, CEP Eco Reader. Okay? And then once it's published, and do a good job, you know, show, you know write a good essay, because you guys are good at that, because you're Colgate students, and show how thoughtful you are and what, how good you are at compare and contrast, and you've got a great headline, and, you know, catchy thesis topic and sentence, and, you know, you do the whole thing, right? And then, you know, then you send them the link. To the article, say thanks very much for the interview. Here's the article. Thought you might to read it. And then what do they do? Well, they send it to their mom, right? Who wouldn't send that article to their mom? That's what I would do. Um, okay. Uh, and then you know, once they write back and say thanks for the article, then you can say, oh, and by the way, you know, I'm going to be in Boulder this summer. I'm really excited about your work. You know, is there any possibility of an internship, or do you know of anybody who's hiring in this space, right? So then you can actually engage with them and, and talk about sort of the job search, right? So think about what you've done in the context of that. Is you've done your research, you've done your homework, and before you even talk to anybody about a job, you've demonstrated all of the soft skills that employers are looking for. Research, writing, outreach, entrepreneurial energy, you know, everything that anybody's going to be looking for. So, you know, you can apply for jobs in Boulder online, and you'll be one of 300 applicants, and, you know, maybe you'll get it. But this is absolutely what you want to do. Right? You want to find the people, and as a student you can do this, you want to find the people you most want to work with in the world and figure out how to work with them. And it'll work, right? And if it doesn't work, you can do it again, right? If you do it three times, you pretty much talk to everybody in Boulder, Colorado doing interesting work, and everybody will know about you. And you won't have to, you know, you will have done it. Okay? Now you know what to do. And if you call me in two years, I'll probably tell you to do that. Uh, but it's okay, because you might forget. Other questions? Yeah? You said you were going to talk about waiting versus... Ah, yeah, okay. Should I wait? Um, okay, from the point of view of the planet, you know, waiting to go to graduate school, you know, taking a couple of years off, would be like my dad saying, you know, I think I'm going to take a couple of years off before I go fight the Nazis in France. You know, just go find myself. You know, it's, yeah. That's where we're at, right? I mean, seriously, if, if you know you want to do this work um, uh, and you want to get into it in your early 20s, we need you. You know, we need you. So from the point of view of the planet, you should absolutely get tooled up as fast as you can and be in a position to make a difference as fast as you can. Now, the reasons not to go to graduate school right away are, A, you get a great job doing this stuff and you just go do it. Uh, that's hard because these are competitive jobs. Um, so, but if you can do that, do that. Um, second reason is that you're, you're not quite sure which direction you want to go. You don't know whether you want to go policy, business, or education. And you don't want to go to graduate school if, you don't, if you're not relatively sure about one of those buckets being of interest to you. You don't need to know what you're going to do when you're done, and you don't need to know what specific thing you want to work on. Because graduate school will help you figure that out. It will expose you to lots of ideas and opportunities. But you do have to have a broad sense of, you know, I think business is for me, or policy is for me, or education is for me. Okay? And then the third reason, of course, is I can't pay for it. I just can't afford it. Um, and the, the bad news here is that you, you can't really get somebody to pay you to do a master's degree. You can get somebody to pay you poorly to do a PhD. Um, but that's seven, six, seven years of your life, and you will be paid poorly, and, uh, and you have to love research. You know, it's got to be what you want to do. And it's not save the world work in any immediate sense. Right. Um, um, but on the master side, you know, you're going to have to, you can find grants and loans, but, you, you know, most people are going to have to take out loans. Now, don't pay attention to the sticker price. Um, so whatever they say it's going to cost, it will cost less than that. So what you do is you apply, you get in, uh, you submit your FAFSA or your international student, you apply, and, and you'll get a financial aid award, some scholarship. Uh, and programs typically also have work-study opportunities, research assistantships, teaching assistantships that can defray the cost. But most students will wind up taking out loans. And it's an investment, you know. It really is saying, okay, I'm going to do this because I need to get into, I want to get into a position where I can actually make a difference in a hurry and, and get paid more. Um, as a consequence. Uh, the government says that 
and this is good advice in general, is that you shouldn't take out more loans than you think you're going to make in the first year out of school, whether that's undergrad or grad. So we figure our policy students will make forty to 50000 a year. And so we're comfortable. We wish zero is a better number, but if you need to take out forty dollars to $50,000 in loans to support that degree, then that's fine. All right, what if you're already in debt? You know, and you can't, you're going to push well beyond that. Then there is an out, and this is an important one to know about. If you take out the right kind of loans, and you work in the, in the NGO sector or the government sector for 10 years, following your degree, whether it's an undergraduate or graduate degree, and you pay the minimum amount on your loans every month that's required, um, after 10 years, the government will forgive the balance. Okay? So if you, and many of our policy students are going to do that. They're going to work in NGO or government sector. They're not going to go private sector. So as long as you're willing to say, I'm not going to work in the private sector for, for 10 years out of my graduate degree or, or undergraduate degree, then, you know, you can actually take on additional loans. Um, you know, it's, it's a challenge, right? But there, there is an avenue there that makes it possible. Okay? So the other thing is you might say, well, you know, I should really get some experience so I can persuade these graduate schools to let me in. Because, you know, as a graduate admissions person, I'd much rather have somebody who, you know, had been in college and then actually had a couple years of cool work experience, and, you know. Um, but that's my problem, not yours, right? So if I let you in, I'm going to let in Colgate students, okay, because they're great. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, then you get the benefit of working with all these 26 and 27 and 33-year-olds, right, as a 22-year-old, and that just ups your game incredibly, right? Uh, so uh, from, the point of, from your point of view, it's a great time to go to graduate school because you get you're sort of immediately exposed to people with more experience and more maturity, and you're surrounding yourself with, you know, a community that's going to really help you succeed. Um, so that's a long answer to your question, but I think I hit all, all the bases. <clears throat> Before folks go, make sure if you're interested that that paper is circulated. Um, there's one back there as well. If you want more information about our graduate programs, and of course I'm up here as well, I'd be glad to chat. Um, for a few minutes. Other questions about this? Yeah. Uh, so maybe the not quite unfair question. Yeah. But oh, we love unfair the, the cases. So you, you gave a, a series of sort yep. of students from your yep. programs who you know gone yep. and done interesting things. But uh, so how many students are typically graduating in a year, and how? Yeah. Well, our students are doing very well in the job market. We had 12 students graduate last year, and of them, nine are currently employed. Two of them are international students, or, or going to graduate school, further graduate work, PhD, or law school. Um, and the two, uh, two of the ones who aren't employed are um, international students who you know, went back to Italy or Nigeria. Uh, uh, and we actually, what we did, we actually went through and we got LinkedIn snapshots of all of our graduates. Um, and... Uh, it's an impressive roster. We have about 250 graduates of both programs, and they're just doing great things around the world. Um, I think when we did some survey work, what we found was that after five years, something like 85%, as far as we could tell, were working in the field. Some people have chosen not to, you know, moved on. But that's, that was sort of our employment uh, record. So, I mean, the good news is there are jobs out there, and there are going to be more jobs out there because... These problems are going to keep getting worse. Um, uh, so, uh, in particular, I think the climate science and policy degree is, an, is a really powerful degree um, because, you know, in spite of the politics of the moment, we're going to deal with this. And it might be 2020 and it might be 2024, but that's when you guys would be really prime in the labor market. And there's going to be a real shortage of people that understand core climate science combined with having kind of the economics and politics skills associated with doing good policy. And everybody's come out of our climate degree has, has found good work um, um, because the jobs are there. Yeah, other comments, questions? We'll come back tonight. Let's talk about politics because <laughs> that's going to be fun. <laughs>